Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Coffee and Conversation right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host. And today we are joined by Monique Lassan. Uh, she is a licensed a licensed private investigator as well as an author. But I'm really, really interested in your story. How are you? I'm doing great. Actually, uh, I'm in Sonoma County in the United States. We're in sheltering place, but at least it's not a total lockdown. So I'm good. That's true. Well, and you've actually, I, I was very blessed. You took me on a little tour of where you are, and it, it looks absolutely stunning. So at least you have outdoor space, and you can go for lovely walks and, you know, in, enjoy your, your area. So it's all right. Yeah, it's, I'm blessed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I want to get right into it. Now, you know, something that a lot of people don't talk about is child trafficking. And um, the situation around the world in regards to children um, being taken or children being sold, because this isn't something that is just, you know, a child is kidnapped. Sometimes it's actually a child being sold by a parent or by a, a relative um, for the financial gain. Now, let me just start by asking, um, where are these kids mainly from that, that get into child trafficking, that are, that are trafficked? Well, let's start from the beginning. One of the things that people have to understand, kids go missing now more than ever, but this is nothing new. In the past, kids went missing, you weren't able to find them as fast as we can, but also nowadays with the with the start of the internet about 20 years ago, kids get lured into the world of sex trafficking. I also want to differentiate sex trafficking from human trafficking. Human trafficking is a world criminal organization, just like the third actually after weapon and um, uh, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> The criminal organization that sells children and people in general is something that is happening all around us. It is a criminal organization and it all involves the mafia at the beginning, but nowadays uh, it goes into the world of satanic calls and government organizations for the use of experiments with children. So human trafficking involves um, domestic servitude, uh, child brides, uh, children that are used as weapons. Can we start this over at yeah. all? Let me, yeah, let me no, let's do that. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll start right from the beginning. And, and what I'll do is actually I'll, I'll just start off with asking how you got to be a private investigator, and then we can go from there. That is good. That is okay. Good. Right. Uh, hold on. Well, okay. okay. I, I, I've just I've forgotten one word and I can't think of it under pressure. That's okay. Don't worry. We'll we'll figure out a way through it. We'll figure out a way through okay. it. Okay. I won't even talk about it. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Coffee and Conversation right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and today I am joined by private investigator out of California by the name of Monique Lassan. How are you, Monique? I'm doing great. We are a little bit more free here in Northern California than I guess you guys are in Spain. So I'm blessed. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to have you on board because you have a really interesting story to tell. Um, you are a private investigator. You uh, have actually been called the voice of the voiceless. Um, you deal in child trafficking um, mainly, um, but you have your own story to tell. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and what sort of gave you the drive to become a private investigator to begin with? Okay, I'd be happy to. Um, I started out as a journalist, actually. I went to school to study journalism. And my mother was a policewoman from Iran. She was actually one of the first policewomen who became a lieutenant. I went to French private school where 
the queen of Iran went and I was surrounded by pe people in the military that worked for the king and we had no voice. Women had no voice, children had no voice. Uh, the religion was shoved down our throat and I was always uh, somebody who spoke up. I was a total rebel right from the beginning. I wanted to follow up my, with my mother's path in law enforcement and she told me to stay more open and not work for the government for good reason. My uncle, my cousin, and my brother all went to prison, political prison, and the, they were all tortured. And so when I came to the United States, actually I went to France first, studied French since I was four. Then I came to the United States when I was 16 and, and went to school, got my degree in criminal justice and later in forensic science. I realized that um, I did an internship as a private investigator. The reason I even chose private investigation, uh, when I was 19, I was kidnapped in Los Angeles by a very rich Persian multimillionaire in Beverly Hills. And after a, almost a week, I escaped, not until I was assaulted, raped, and before he was able to do anything else, including sell me as a sex victim, uh, I was able to escape that ordeal. And I vowed to myself to not ever allow another child or a young person to go through what I went through. And I still feel very blessed. What's really interesting, one out of 10 women have been either victimized, assaulted, raped, or know someone who has. That's really interesting. One out of yes. 10 actually is not. So in other words, nine out of 10 women have known someone who has been victimized or sexually assaulted which is fascinating to me because I started uh, working as a private investigator, um, non-licensed in San Diego, um, supporting children and uh, sex crimes against children and abuse, just, uh, you know, um, physical abuse against children. It wasn't until I was actually kidnapped that I realized that this is such a huge issue and it was not the first time, it was not the second time. I've heard that. And so making long story short, um, I started making this my niche. It became something I really wanted to do. Uh, I moved to Barcelona and here's the story of sex trafficking. I saw women dressed in rags, basically, dropped off in the morning, by some van, this is in Barcelona, and they started asking for money, like, ayudame por favor, and they always carry these little children in their arms. And I watched them. Finally, I befriended, and I did undercover work, watching these women uh, and asking this particular woman, they are from Romania, Bulgaria, and a lot of other third world countries nearby. And I said, what's the deal? So she told me, she was a beautiful woman. She says, the mafia that dropped them off, they actually kidnapped little children as well as props. And they asked for money all day long. They pick them up in the afternoon and then they put them in sexy clothes at night to be sex trafficking. It was disgusting and fascinating. These little kids that were used as props were drugged all day long, whether it snowed or rained, they were drugged out, passed out, and I watched them. And so when I came back to the United States, I joined Sir Optimus International and I started uh, doing a lot of uh, conferences. I spoke about it in seminars. I started um, Teens Against Human Trafficking. And here I am. Um, well, let me ask yep. you, uh, it doesn't, it's not just um, children that are from disadvantaged situations that end up in this cycle of 
violent, as it were. I mean, we have a tool in our homes that will allow anybody to access our children at any time, if we're not careful, um, to lure those kids out because you know, you could be a 15 year old in in a middle class society or a middle class household and be lured out uh, the promise of being a famous model, for example. Well, a lot of kids nowadays, thanks to the Internet, they easily befriend someone or somebody befriend them. And it's called grooming. They get groomed into the world of sex trafficking. And there could be um, also adoption companies is another one beside models, beside just regular kids. They don't know who they're talking to. Also, exchange students. These are all different ways of being lured into another world. So I always tell parents, watch your kids. I tell kids, watch who you're talking to. Uh, parents really need to watch their children and access the internet and put different limitations on the, on the computers. So these groomers are much older, they're not 15, they're not 14, they're not even the same age. By the time they gain your child's confidence and they ask them to come to their country to visit them or exchange students to be a part of a family, you don't know where you're going. By the way, this is not just international problems. This is right here in your own backyard. I live in the most beautiful place on earth, Sonoma County. And uh, besides sex trafficking, obviously, we have domestic servitude and uh, child labors and all of that. But right here in Sonoma County, children, I actually worked with a mother whose child was actually not even that young. She was 19. In colleges, they got lured by these brokers and they befriended them. And she, this particular child was a uh, special need taken by another girl, same age, and she disappeared. And there is a Stockholm syndrome that you start relating to the person that you're with and that your kidnapper basically becomes your friend. They even come to your home, befriend your families. So situations, two of them, let me tell you about them. This particular child that was special need were taken for months and the law enforcement didn't do anything about it. By the time the mother got involved and I got involved, she was saying, I don't want to come home. They bought me a pink car and I love pink cars. She wanted to stay, even though she was raped over and over by this group of people. And then she was finally found. She, like I said, she didn't want to come home. Those kids, become brokers for another group of kids. And I had another child that was, she was 15 years old, kidnapped by her own boyfriend, taken to a party. She drank from an open punch bowl. That's why I always say don't accept drinks from, you know, open punch bowls, right? So she was taken to another room, raped, by a hell of a lot of people in the party, hooked on heroin and gone, disappeared. By the time she, we found her through her cell phone, she was so hooked on heroin, a lot of these kids end up committing suicide. She was Persian, Persian girl. And so the family was so ashamed, they took her all the way back to Iran and never to be found. Do you find that there are certain cultures that tend to, if these children are found or if these children are sold and then, and then you know, brought back to their families, are there certain cultures that will not accept those kids back? Yeah, basically, um, a lot of, you know, Middle Eastern families are very um, strict about those rules. As you know, they want virgins and so forth. So, my God. But here's, I wanted to say something very important. Cultures, it's not just American cultures. America, United States is a source country and a receiving country. Indian is Northern America alone. 300,000 children go missing 
every year. This is according to the Department of Justice. This is just North America, which includes Canada. Mm. Um, then you can take it to all over the world. I cannot tell you what a big problem this is. So other countries, usually power, you know, the countries like Moldova, Ukraine, Lithuania, Russia, uh, Turkey, Middle Eastern countries, like including Saudi Arabia and Iran, kids, boys and girls go missing and boy, they don't come back because of the rules of the cultures. Um, so countries like Denmark, Sweden, uh, and Nor Norwegian countries, basically, they arrest the Johns, not so much the girls. And that's what we need to do. We need to actually arrest the men that push these problems forward in, instead of those little kids. But that's not how it is done in America, as you know. No, no. Well, you've also written a book, actually, about all of this. So there is a book out there that pretty much has your, the, the most interesting cases that you've worked on. Yes, Children of the Underworld. Um, and that is for sale on Amazon, is it not? It is. And you can also find in Barnes and Nobles. And this is inspired by true events. And basically, it is about a child that was abducted. And these are collective information and cases that I've done, other investigators done on child abductions of kids, not just sex trafficking, but also those were involved uh, by governments around the world, including Singapore, Malaysia. So this particular child was abducted from United States, taken to Barcelona. There is parts of, there are many parts of my own life in it that comes in as memories. So it's not really focused about my life, but you can see a little bit about how I became a private investigator and how this child ended up in Malaysia and Singapore and what happened to her. And you can also see that satanic cults have a lot to do with it, how pornography have so much to do with it. And Bohemian Grove right here in Northern California, which is only 20 minutes from my house, which involves government agents all the way to the top involved with it. How Pizza Gate that people think is just, um, you know, a high, uh, it's not real, that it's just rumor, it's a conspiracy. It's not. I've worked. What is Pizza Gate? Oh, <laughs> Pizzagate, uh, the, if you remember back in, with the Hillary Clinton and all those mm -hmm. emails that were deleted, the Pizzagate okay. involves the satanic calls and supposedly this pizza parlors right here in the United States uh, with satanic pictures of children in the worst possible ways involves cannibalism. and. A lot of that was mentioned in my book as well. Uh, the, McMartin wow. case, the McMartin case, which involves 360 children, uh, 364 children that went missing during the time of, it, it was actually McMartin case is um, uh, kindergarten in Southern California. This is back in the 80s. And Ted Gonderson was the investigator who was an FBI agent, who well, by the time he investigated it, he, he, he was demoted from being a director of FBI. There were tunnels on the ground from this um, kindergarten where children during the day were taken and pornography was made from them and they were taken to different places whether you believe this or not that's a huge case it was the most expensive case in U united states during that time um and kids came forward and testified 
So what you're saying is it it can happen to anybody and pretty much at any age because it doesn't even stop at the children. They they actually, you know, women are are taken and trafficked even into their adulthood. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a uh, usually happens the the children that are taken usually by strangers and by family members. So children ages four to 10 usually don't come back. They are groomed. Uh, if they're young, they're taken by pedophiles, usually within 72 hours, they don't last, they are killed. When they are around 10 to 14, 15 years of age, they are perfect age for trafficking. They keep them as um, virgins and they are sold and uh, auctioned out even over the internet. And by the time they're 15 to 17, 18, they are, they are sold over and over. Some of them, when they're younger, adoption companies sell them. I had a case in Paulo, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, this four-year-old child, um, Zhao, Zhao, they, they'll call them. He was kidnapped by his own grandfather right outside the door and sold to adoption companies from Venezuela and sold to this couple from Israel. Unbelievable stuff, but it happens because a lot of families, they have six, seven children and one of them go missing, they need the money. So they sell them like India, like Thailand, like Brazil, it happens every day. That's insane. So how can people protect their children from this happening to them? Right now, well, let, let me just say, um, beside the internet, those kids that go missing uh, because predators are watching them, they are profiling them for many months sometimes. And a lot of children that are younger, like 14, 15, they, you know, as I'm sure you heard, some of these children, they get kidnapped. They are living right down the street, not that far away in somebody's basement. And they become mothers of new children for years. Um, it's unfortunate. Those are the most unfortunate ones that I know. Those kids that go missing because of the internet and those tools, uh, parents can do something about them. Parents can be more involved with the children's lives. You need to know who's coming and going, who's the, ch who's the child or people, your children are communicating via Facebook, via social media. Who are those people? Know them, get to know them, get to know their families and their parents. But even that is not enough. I know of a child, 16-year-old, who for a long time, her friend who was the same age, came to the house, knew the family for months. One day, her friend said, oh, let's go clean my friend's house. My father has this cleaning agency, and we can make some money. She even asked her mom, a mile away from the, from the house, this child went to clean somebody's house and for almost a year disappeared just a mile away kidnapped raped over and over and sold to sex trafficking um, companies and by the time she was found by accident because somebody knew somebody who saw her she was damaged attempted suicide so many times it's, you know, I, when you talk, you know, I've got three children and, um, you know, I think sometimes we think that they're in our home and we know that our door is locked and we feel a sense of safety, but we've actually opened the door because with allowing them to have all of their devices with the Wi-Fi and not checking up on what they're doing online, 
we've literally left our doors wide open. Uh, Rhea, I'd like to read you a couple of poems that I wrote and it's in the back of the book. And when I speak in conferences and a lot of seminars, I read them. I actually made them into uh, a play. Uh, it's from perspective of a child that has gone missing. And then the second poem is from the perspective of a sex trafficker, if I can read it for you. Yes, please. It's in the back of the book. I added it because people need to know what happens in the mind of a trafficker and in the mind of the victim. Okay, so I have to wear my glasses. <laughs> One second. Okay. It's called, Who Are These Faces? A little girl holding a teddy bear. Innocence radiating from her eyes. What becomes of her, this child, sold into modern day slavery by her own family in need of money? Her mother, her father, who gave her life, her freedom, her soul, or now just property. Seeing her, soon her innocence disappears. Her eyes grow dark, turning tricks for the highest bidder, hoping to eat today and live till tomorrow. But honestly, she wishes she was dead because death would be better existence than her own existence. However, she has no way out. Her body, just property. Who are these faces? These human traffickers who profits at her expense, at the expense of others, destroying lives a dollar at a time. Yet the little girl holding the teddy bear long forgotten to the world until another little girl, innocent, holding a teddy bear is sold. Just property. Who are these faces? This was from the perspective of a of a child. Now, the second one is from the perspective of a trafficker. The mind of a sex trafficker. I have no shame, no excuse. I need money. I live in a world surrounded by prop poverty. I am the father who sells his own daughter. I am the uncle that betrays his own niece and lures her into the world of sex trade. I am that man, I am the trafficker, and I am guilty. At first, I feel bad, but soon I avoid listening to their screams. Then I avoid looking into their eyes. But after the first rape, the first punch, the first murder, they all become just faces. They mean nothing to me. I have a family to feed. And that's how I feed them, with the blood of others. I wrote that. Wow. I felt it. And I haven't, I have, I feel like people really need to understand what's going on behind the scene. The worst part of this whole thing is that they are not that different than you and I. In, co in countries when a person, like for example, in India, my sister lived in India, and they have 10 children. They don't, even, they, they don't have the money to feed them. So if a person comes and say, hey, I can give you $500 for one child, they sell them easily. It's the truth. In Thailand, I, I, I was in Singapore twice. I did two sex trafficking cases in, in Singapore. That's why my, my book is based in Singapore and Malaysia. <sighs> okay. I get Sounds. really emotional about things like this, so I'm going to wait for your question. <laughs> no, you know what? I mean, it's, I think 
what people can do as a whole is really watch your children because, you know, from what you've said, it, it doesn't just happen in countries like that. As you said, in North America alone, 300,000 children um, per year are going missing. And it can happen from any socioeconomic background as well. It doesn't have to be somebody who's poor. It, it, as in your case, you were kidnapped right off the street as a teenager by a multimillionaire who was a well-known artist. Um, so we just have to be aware, we have to be careful, and we have to look after one another and keep an eye on our kids just in general. Well, you know, like um, a couple of years ago, I went hiking and I saw two little children, ages maybe six and seven. And I asked them, I said, where are your parents? Oh, back there. Do you know that the parents, two mothers, soccer moms, a mile away, a mile away, I run toward them. I said, where are your children? Oh, they're up there. Well, the children were a mile away. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Yes, they, they may not get kidnapped into sex traffic. And what are the chances? A sex traffic is on a, on a, uh, on a hiking trail. But I can tell you, a lot of pedophiles are. They are. They're hiding. They're everywhere. They look like your father and your grandfather, my husband and your fa your husband. They're not that different. I also studied, um, of course, um, what do you call it? Um, serial killers for my master's. I was going to be a criminal profiler for the FBI. So I took many, many tests and I studied uh, criminal profiling. Who do you think they are? They look just like us. By the way, 99% are men, ages 24 to 55. They're not that old. And they live- Well, I guess, I mean, you're right. Nobody walks around with a, a sign on their forehead stating exactly that they're, you know, you know, I'm a domestic violence uh, abuser. I'm, uh, you know, a pedophile. I'm a, a robber. I'm. People don't have those titles, and we all look alike. That's right. That's right. And people don't realize serial killers live among us for many years. They, yeah. there are so many different type of criminals out there. I don't. If I had a child, by the way, I don't have children. But I care so much about this subject that I dedicate every minute of my life talking about it, bring awareness. And I don't even understand how, <laughs> how people allow their children to, oh, I'm just going to let my 15-year-old, 16-year-old travel to, I don't know, another country as a model or to study Spanish or French. Really? Because the moment they cross that border, they, their passport will be taken away. Now they are paying a debt to someone because they don't have a passport to come back. And whoever kidnapped them, holding them hostage against their will, and they have to service 10 to 20 men a day to pay a debt that doesn't exist. That's insanity. It is insane. I've seen it. I've yeah. seen it in Barcelona. I've seen it in France. I've seen it right here in San Francisco. Yeah, it doesn't matter where in the world you are. Do you know what? Um, I really want to provide uh, your information. Um, we'll make sure that when we air this interview that if people have questions or or anything they can get a hold of you your website and i would really highly recommend people go and uh, buy your book um children of the underworld i think that uh, looks like a really interesting read and i think i'm going to be heading over to amazon and buying that myself children of the underworld by monique lasan uh, it is on Amazon and actually is in England. And uh, I just saw it in Germany, many different places. You can actually order it very quickly. And this is not even about me. I have to say, Ria, this is not about me, this book, this interview. It's about people waking up to something that might not be 
touching them today. It might not be your child or their family's children that are missing, but don't be fooled thinking that you can put your head in the sand, your butt sticking out (laughs) because you don't see it. If it doesn't happen to me, maybe it doesn't exist, but it does. It happens to somebody else's child. Believe me, 300,000 children that go missing, that maybe not, it's not on the milk carton. Where are they? How come it's not all over the news? How come it's not all over the internet? How come you and I don't hear about it? Where is this number coming from? Yeah, and not a lot of these children are as important. I mean, there have been cases that we've seen around the world that have been brought to the forefront and millions of dollars or millions of pounds um, have been put into finding these children years later. But when you take a look at what you're saying, over 300,000 in North America alone, why is one child getting more attention than all the others? And why is one child worth more? than all the others. And that's something that I think needs to be addressed. Well, which is really interesting question that you're asking. What happens to the other children? There are, many of these children are kidnapped from uh, foster cares. I, <laughs> that's another show all in itself. Adoption companies and foster children go missing more than anything. A lot of Native American children go missing from places like South Dakota, Um, they are kidnapped and some of them are actually placed for adoptions by white families. And then they go missing. Why? Some of these children are taken from uh, very, very poor families. They are expandable. You don't care, but they are missing. They are off the street. A lot of runaway children Please pay attention to this. Runaway children, those young adults are number one target. Within 72 hours, they will be approached by a sex trafficker. Within 72 hours. Yeah. And uh, parents have to pay attention to those kids. <sighs> yeah. No, I can see it. it. It really matters to you. And I, you know, I, as I said, I'm a mother of three and it's definitely something that you know, I I need to wake up to as well. It doesn't matter where you live in the world that you really do have to pay attention and you have to, you know, sort of keep an eye on your children's activities because you never know who, who the friend or foe is. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Uh, Monique, I've got to say thank you very much. Okay. Just, just one last thing. Those 300,000 children that go missing, some of those children come back just so you know, Within, you know, 48 hours, some of those children that are coming back are still counted as part of that 300,000. I want to mention that just so it's part of this finding. Yeah. So uh, it's important for people to know that. So anyways, thank you, Ria, for interviewing me today. Uh, I hope it makes a difference. I hope my book makes a difference. My voice makes a difference. And believe me, your voice makes a difference. And I really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, we really appreciate your time and your expertise in this subject. And I really do think that uh, parents should buy your book just so that they can get sort of a reality check, as it were, um, and, you know, maybe apply it to their daily lives. We've got lots of time right now, straight across the face of the planet, to sit down and read a book. So uh, I do suggest going out and buying Children of the Underworld. Um, Thank you again, Monique. This has been Monique Lassan uh, out of California. She is not only a private investigator, but as well an author. So thank you for your time. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. You've been watching another edition of Coffee and Conversation right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I have been your host. We'll see you next time. Thank you.